Kukia. I love living here. But before I lived here, I lived in a small southern city where I was told I could never be a local because both of my grandmothers were not born in the city. My first winter here, I went sledding on Carmichael Hill. And since apparently that is what the locals do, I was now a local. The Tri-Cities has a history of transplants like me. And as a result, it provides a welcoming and inclusive community for many. But over the years that I found, not all have had that same experience that I have. Why is that? Historical bias is present here in the Tri-Cities. So to understand historical bias, we have to first start by understanding bias. Bias is defined as a tendency to believe that some people or ideas are better than others. This results in treating some people unfairly. McCullough identifies the act of historical bias as bias through the eye of the historian. It's inferring facts from, taking the facts from the past and inferring meaning onto those facts. The meaning of which is not limited to anything and can be part of his own creative imagination. In the Tri-Cities, we find that the result of this historical bias can sometimes result in not having the entire history being presented as it was once lived, as wholly and completely as it was once lived. Sometimes, though, we see that intentionally or unintentionally, that historical bias is present in decisions that are made here today. But before we talk about specific examples of historical bias, let's start by a little tiny bit of history of the Tri-Cities, because we have 18 minutes. <laughs> Prior to the 1800s, African, American Indians gathered in this area, which was originally called Great Plains. By about the 1800s, the end of the 1800s, the cities had been established in the Tri-Cities, and Pasco actually at that time was the largest of the three cities, primarily due to the railroad and agriculture. But the Manhattan Project, which I'll refer to today as the Hanford Project, changed all of that, along with changing the lives of those who lived in the Tri-Cities and surrounding communities, many through forced relocation. Relocation is a common theme here for Native Americans, for the people of the community, for those who've moved in. And as we've mentioned, that results in a generally welcoming environment for many, and not all have had that same experience. So with that foundation, let's talk about some examples of historic bias. And we'll start with the Hanford Project. The war era culture was that of silence. Secrecy was the ideal, and understandably so, for the war effort. Don't ask, don't tell, don't know. But it's likely that this don't ask, don't tell culture impacted the Tri-Cities beyond just the war years. It may be perhaps why some of the exclusionary practices and segregation that occurred here lasted for as long as it did. But more on that in a minute. Let's turn now to some more present day examples of historic bias. For example, we'll start with the city of Richland. You may or may not have heard this said or said it yourself. The city of Richland's just a government town relying on government money. We all know that there is so much more here, though. Software, energy, education, healthcare, multitude of small businesses. The bias here is referring to a community as something that's limiting and from specifically entirely only the past. Of course, there's still government jobs here, but that is not all we are, and that's not all that we can be. Second example is looking at the structure of the three distinct and separate cities. The cities each have reward systems in place that support single city outcomes. These do not foster nor reward collaboration. An example of this was Kennewick's recent attempt to publicly fund The Link, an entertainment center. As only the residents of Kennewick could vote for, something that could benefit the entire Tri-Cities community, the vote did not pass. Could a different outcome have been achieved if a different approach had been taken? citywide view? We don't know under this current climate. What we do know is that actually in the 80s, there were a couple of attempts at consolidation, two different votes, in fact, and neither passed. And those recent community roundtables that some of you may have participated in, they didn't exactly result in any greater collaboration nor consolidation. Let's return now to the Hanford Project for our next example of historic bias in our community. And that's that the project itself was segregated. Residential, recreational, and religious facilities were each separated by color. 
There were 60,000 or so total Hanford workers during the course of the Manhattan Project, and about 15,000 or so were African American. And when the population became too big at the Hanford Project, the leaders of the project reached out into the local community to find a place to build an African American barracks. Only one city would permit this, Pasco. And then only one barracks was permitted in East Pasco. But that does not mean that the local community at the time was supportive. It's been said that during that time frame, roughly 80% of businesses refused to serve black patrons. These less than ideal treatment of diverse citizens laid the groundwork for more practices to continue in our area. Our final example of historical bias is going to be that of Kennewick. For years after the war, in fact, until the end of the 60s, Kennewick was known as a sundown town. This distressing practice was not uncommon in the United States at that time. A sundown town is a town where people of color are not permitted in your community after sunset. For Kennewick, on this old green bridge you see here, it's been torn down since the cable bridge was built, there used to be a sign that reminded people of color to be out of the community by sunset. The exclusionary practices of our past draw us to the need for purposeful inclusionary acts of our present and future. On that line, African Americans have said that they were asked to return to Pasco by local police officers in Kennewick. And due to exclusionary and restrictive covenants in place at the time, real estate agents would not sell to black buyers. So how do we foster inclusion? Well, let's look at those who stayed and what they've accomplished. The Tri-Cities community saw many African Americans leave after the end of these things were occurring. Uh, but those who stayed worked hard to foster inclusivity and diversity. We know that there was a population shift because at one time, Pasco had 10% of the population as African American, and today only 2% is. One person who stayed was a man named Arthur Fletcher. He moved to the Tri-Cities and he worked specifically in East Pasco with the poverty and the, and the poor community that was there. And he ultimately ran for city council uh, to bring the needs of the East Pasco community to the city government level. He was one of the very first African Americans elected to office in the state of Washington. It's interesting though, because you look at our diversity makeup of our city councils today and they seem to still be somewhat limited. Or very limited, depending on how you want to look at that. It's interesting that the research of Lowen, Ficken, and Warren presents the facts that the result of these exclusionary practices for such a period of time, from segregation into the sundown era and beyond, have long and lasting impacts beyond just those time frames. So how do we continue to foster inclusion? Ordinances are created and cities are led by their elected leaders. Elected leaders are voted into office by those who both participate in the act of voting and register to vote. But there's a breakdown between those who are registering to vote and actually voting. Let's look, for example, at this most recent, last month, August 2016 election. We see some distressing results. Only 33% of Benton County registered voters voted, representing only 28% of the entire population of Benton County. The numbers for Franklin County, or I'm sorry, that was 18%, because the numbers for Franklin County are 28% of registered voters voted, which is only 10% of the entire population of Franklin County. I feel like the number of people who are making decisions on behalf of all of us is a really small number. And I knew I was going to be giving this talk while that uh, ballot was in my hands, and I still managed to forget to put it in the mail. So I am equally as guilty of not helping to make the change that I so believe we need here in this community. Maybe we need to have a fill out your ballot meetups or something. <laughs> but point being, we have to participate if we want to make change. I still believe that the Tri-Cities is well positioned to overcome historic bias in our community. But how do we start? Well, Malcolm Gladwell suggests in his book, Tipping Point, that small but precisely targeted steps can have broad and lasting impact and reach. But I believe that it starts with us individually. Small, specific steps can pave the way for great things to happen. Let's look at a couple of examples most recently that have had some impact. The Pasco Taco Crawl, the Kennewick Diversity Commission, and organizations that are starting to be established that, that foster economic inclusivity, such as views. The Pasco Taco Crawl is a small step 
that help to positively impact the perception of downtown Pasco in our local community. The Diversity Commission is a testimony to the efforts of local community members and city leaders to move beyond the exclusionary and segregated aspects of our past that we've just discussed, and to embrace diversity as necessary and relevant for our present and our future. So what else can we do besides vote and participate in these events? Is we can hold our community leadership and ourselves accountable for our future. We can become engaged citizens. We can foster education and outreach efforts that will help to support inclusion. I believe that there are barriers to entry and lack of value perceived for participation in our communities, and I don't know why, but we need to figure that out. The reason I feel that way is because we all know that the Diversity Commission came about because of one council member's comments about an entire population, the Hispanic community in our community. But when that position, that commission opened up for people to apply, only two people who identified as Hispanic actually applied. Why is that? Is that because of 25% of a community in Kennewick, only two people cared? I do not believe that's the case. I believe that there are barriers to entry that we do not know exist, or there is an education process needed to identify the value for participation. I hope one day that we live in a community where there are hundreds of applications for positions on councils and commissions and that people are excited and passionate about building this community that we all live in. The Tri-Cities is a unique community and we should learn from our history. It's good to know where we came from. And I believe that because of our history of relocation, we have a propensity here for inclusion. It would serve us well to consciously decide to not use the past as a rationale for limiting our future. The efforts of many engaged community members over the years give hope that our community can become even more welcoming, more inclusive, more collaborative, and more representative of all. I love living here, and I hope you do too. Thank you.